Today we are hosting um, former Admiral Harry Harris. Um, Harry Harris was an Admiral in the United States Navy where he served in every geographic combatant command region. He was commander of the US Pacific Fleet from 2013 to 2015. He then commanded the US Indo-Pacific Command until 2018. And most recently, he served as US Ambassador to South Korea from July of 2018 to January of this year. Um, today, he is coming to speak about um, general East Asian and US relations, specifically um, about uh, US foreign policy in that area, especially with regards to like the South China Sea. So um, without further ado, I'll give it up for former Admiral Harry Harris. Okay, hey everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak uh, to this allies group. Uh, I wanna thank co-directors Haider Ali and Connor Akiyama for the invitation to come to speak with you all tonight. Uh, happy Cinco de Mayo Day. Uh, this is May 5th and those of you that you all are watching me instead of party hardying uh, speaks highly uh, of your uh, interest and it's quite amazing uh, to be sure, but I'm gonna have a drink anyway. All right, um, now I can't think of a better way to begin the beginning of the end of the pandemic. Get vaccinated if you haven't, that's my public service announcement for the evening. Uh, in my post-government life, uh, then to share with you my thoughts on the alliance between the United States and the Republic of Korea, or ROK. Now, before I get started, uh, let me say just a few words on the deplorable events of January 6th in Washington. The violent actions of the mob that attacked the U.S. Capitol, an attack on U.S. democracy itself, serve as the sharpest reminder of America's challenges, but also of America's ultimate strength, resilience, and long-standing commitment to democracy. I take hope from Amanda Gorman's inaugural poem that our nation, quote, isn't broken, but simply unfinished, unquote. President Biden is now the 46th commander in chief of the US. I emphasized to my interlocutors in South Korea before I left last January that the noble work of the Alliance will continue. And I express my confidence that President Biden and his team will continue to work with leaders there to strengthen their relationship in all its dimensions, not just the security one. Paraphrasing Goethe, divide and rule is one approach to governance and unite and lead is another. I'll also add that May is National Asian American Pacific Islander uh, American Heritage Month. I bring this up in the context of the deplorable acts of violence we see aimed at Asians and Asian Americans in our own country. So let's each of us commit to doing what we can to end this in all forms of ethnic violence and ethnic hatred. Now, as I've said on countless occasions in uniform and now in Mufti, uh, international relationships matter and alliances matter. They are the most integral element of US foreign policy. I hope you've had the chance to read the Biden administration's new interim security guidance, interim strategic guidance rather. It recognizes that alliances are not luxuries, they're essentials. President Biden calls alliances our greatest asset. Last month in a joint op-ed, Secretaries Blinken and Austin made it clear that alliances are vital to our national security. They deliver for the American people. In my opinion, this guidance underscores that when working with allies, give and take is preferred to slash and burn. Case in point, the almost 71 year US ROK alliance was forged during a devastating conflict. It stood the test of time. It's mind boggling to consider how much has changed in the world in general, Northeast Asia in particular, and, North, and the Korean Peninsula, especially since 1950. Some changes have been for the better, such as the ROK's miraculous growth into an economic and cultural powerhouse, a high-tech innovation nation, which is leading by example in the battle against COVID-19. As you may have heard, South Korea faced a third wave of COVID-19 outbreaks at the end of 2020, centered in the capital and surrounding areas. Korea went on virtual lockdown when they had a thousand cases a day across a country of 52 million people. Now, as of today, uh, Korea has experienced a total of about 125,000 cases and only 1,847 deaths 
since the pandemic began 15 months ago. Contrast those numbers with ours, 32 million cases and almost 600,000 deaths. Korea's approach on COVID-19 has been lauded, rightly so, as a global model. It's not that complicated. Follow the rules and follow the science. Other changes have been for the worse, such as North Korea's unrelenting pursuit of nuclear weapons. While the DPRK may no longer be the ROK's official enemy, it's helpful to recall that in January 8th's uh, Workers' Party Congress, Kim Jong-un talked about strengthening North Korea's nuclear deterrent and military capabilities. Just last March, the IAEA expressed real concerns about the trajectory of North Korea's nuclear program. And just last month, the US intelligence community formally assessed that Kim Jong-un views nuclear weapons as the ultimate deterrent against foreign intervention, and that over time, North Korea will be accepted as a nuclear power. That doesn't sound to me like KJU is willing to get rid of his weapons anytime soon. But throughout the years, the USRK alliance has remained and continues to be the bulwark against North Korean aggression and the linchpin upon which regional security and stability depend. There's a satellite photo out there of a nighttime view of the Korean Peninsula. This photo and the stark contrast between the beaming south and the pitch black north represents choices and their outcomes. What 67 years of our strategic alliance has brought to the people of the Republic of Korea. As the ROK has changed and developed over the years, so too has the US ROK Alliance. This alliance is dynamic, a multi-dimensional partnership reinforced by shared values, shared concerns, and shared economic interests and underpinned by the deepest people-to-people -people ties. It's lasted generations and will continue to thrive for generations to come, as long as we together nurture it, resource it, and remain committed to it. Today, there are over 2 million Americans of Korean descent, including four members of Congress, senior officials in our military, US diplomats, state and local government officials, entertainers, and wildly successful business leaders. American music and, and movies have long been popular in South Korea, but now Korea is a cultural force in the USA and around the world. Last year, Parasite won the Best Picture Oscar. And this year, Yoon Yoo Jung was the first Korean actress to ever win an acting Oscar as she took home the Best Supporting Actress Oscar at this year's Academy Awards. These strong and growing people of people ties not only constitute the essential fabric of our dynamic bilateral relationship, but also provide the resilience for us to overcome any and all challenges together. Naturally, there are disagreements within the US ROK alliance, which is to be expected in any co-equal partnership spanning over seven decades. The US and ROK continue to work at the highest levels on issues such as defense cost sharing and the future command structure of Korean and American forces on the peninsula as envisioned by the transition of wartime operational control or OPCON. I'm glad we've reached an agreement on cost sharing. Now we can move on to other issues. The US is fully committed to this alliance and it stands firmly with the ROK. So I believe the outlook for the US ROK alliance is good. This is important because as you are all well aware, North Korea and the PRC will continue to test the resolve of this alliance and will seek ways to weaken our strong ties and sow doubt in order to divide us. Now, while we hope for diplomacy with North Korea to be successful, we all recognize that hope alone is not a course of action. US ROK joint military training is designed to support peace on the peninsula and in the region, while ensuring that we maintain readiness and never let our guard down. The quest for dialogue with the North must not be made at the expense of the ability to respond to threats from the North. Dialogue and military readiness must go hand in hand. Idealism must be rooted, rooted in realism. There are ample historical examples of what could happen, including what happened on that fateful day almost 71 years ago, if we're not ready. Just read T.R. Fahrenbach's This Kind of War, if you remain skeptical. It's unfortunate that North Korea has not yet embraced the opportunity presented by three U.S. and three ROK presidential summits. The U.S. continues to seek transform relations 
between Washington and Pyongyang, lasting peace on the Korean Peninsula, and the complete denuclearization of North Korea, all of which were agreed to in Singapore uh, in 2018, and will set the conditions for a brighter future for the North Korean people. While I believe that Singapore was not a perfect agreement, it's a good starting point from which to pursue peace on the peninsula. I hope Chairman and now General Secretary KJU seizes this opportunity. And now a word about the People's Republic of China. I'm often asked whether the ROK is being forced to choose between its own security ally on one hand and its number one trading partner on the other. This is a false narrative designed to sow doubt about the history and the strength of our alliance. The US has partnered well with China on several important fronts, but the United States and Beijing fundamentally disagree on how to approach the current international order. The Chinese government does not keep its word from its treaty with the British on Hong Kong to its human rights abuses against Uyghurs, Tibetans, and others, to its attempts at commercial espionage and its quest to first isolate then dominate Taiwan. As former Assistant Secretary of State Dave Stilwell recently said, the Leninist Politburo that runs China wants to set the world, set the rules for the whole world, which is why it's essential that free nations exercise vigilance. This is why we've made it very clear through our Indo-Pacific strategy that the US rejects foreign policy based on leverage and dominance and seeks instead to strengthen relationships based on respect, equal footing, and fair exchange. We believe in partnership economics. We won't weaponize debt. Instead, we strive to build environments that foster good productive market economies. We encourage every country to work in its own interest to protect its own sovereignty. As a former Secretary of State said, China's bullying in the South China Sea reflects a broader choice for nations in the region, coercion and control or freedom and the rule of law. Now, while the how-to regarding dealing with Beijing will certainly change with the Biden administration, I note that the fundamental understanding of the PRC has not. Consider the Secretary of State Blinken testified at his confirmation hearing that the previous administration's tough approach on Beijing is right, that what is happening in Xinjiang is genocide, and that democracy is being trampled in Hong Kong. Secretary of Defense Austin testified that he's focused on the pacing threat posed by the PRC, and he promised strong support for Taiwan. I wonder if they'll be declared persona non grata by Beijing also. To protect the maritime domains, the U.S. will continue to cooperate with our Indo-Pacific partners, as we've always done, to maintain freedom of navigation and other lawful uses of the sea so that all nations can access and benefit from the maritime commons. In this time of COVID, there are concerns that the PRC is seeking uh, to coerce its neighbors and press its provocative claims in the South China Sea, as well as to bully Taiwan. There are also concerns that the PRC will exploit nations in need of assistance by dangling medical aid in exchange for support of PRC talking points. We all must remain vigilant. Since the end of World War II, the network of US alliances and partnerships has been at the core of a stable and viable Indo-Pacific. No nation can shape the future of the region in isolation, and no vision for the region is complete without a robust network of sovereign countries cooperating to serve their collective interests. So let me highlight the importance of trilateral cooperation between the United States, the Republic of Korea, and Japan. It's crucial for all three nations to work together to enhance our security cooperation and preserve the international rules-based order. Notwithstanding the current tensions between Seoul and Tokyo, the reality is that no important security or economic issue in the region can be addressed without both the ROKs and Japan's active involvement. Now, folks, let me finish by saying that I was given an amazing opportunity to be the ambassador to Korea. Though some of you may beg to differ, I believe there's no better place to serve as a U.S. ambassador and no better partner and strategic ally for the United States than the Republic of Korea. Finally, let me thank you all for your interest in America's national security. It's organizations like allies and people like each of you that ensure that we have a well-informed citizenry of which Theodore Roosevelt 
spoke so eloquently, of Thomas Jefferson rather, spoke so eloquently. A well-informed citizenry is indeed the best defense against tyranny. So thanks for your attention. And I look forward to your questions. I'll take 15 to 20 minutes worth of questions. Over to you. Thank you so much for those remarks. Um, as a Korean American myself, I particularly enjoyed all the comments about um, the great impact of Korean Americans. Um, and my first question, um, oh, by the way, anyone, if anyone has a question, please feel free to raise your hand. I'll call on people um, if you have questions. Um, but I'd like to start uh, very quickly. Uh, and I was wondering if how if you could describe how it was like to take uh, to become the ambassador to South Korea at a time so shortly after the domestic uh, turmoil, let's say, surrounding President Park and how that affected your time in Korea and how that affected when you yeah, first. So uh, that's a really broad co uh, question, Jackson, and, and I'll just uh, just kind of talk a little about it and maybe it'll it'll uh, stimulate some you know more precise questions. Uh, so, you know, I, I spent 40 years in the Navy, as, as you, uh, as was hinted at in my uh, introduction. Uh, and, uh, you know, I ended up as a four star. So, so that was a pretty, pretty, you know, uh, uh, high rank in the military. And I went from that and you know, PACOM has about 400,000 people in it. Uh, uh, PACOM then, now Indo PACOM. And I went from that uh, to the embassy in Seoul, which has about 400 people. So a little bit different in scale but I will tell you that no difference in scope of responsibility. The scope of the job was completely, you know, as you'd expect, different. At Indo-PACOM, at PACOM in my time now, Indo-PACOM, I was, uh, I knew a lot. Uh, I knew a little bit about a lot of countries. You know, we have 36 countries in, in the PACOM AOR uh, area of responsibility. Uh, and we have five treaty allies, uh, a couple of major competitors, and, and uh, hot spots uh, and, and uh, uh, friends and partners. So in that group of stuff, uh, you know, I, I wasn't too deep on any one issue, uh, but I knew a lot about a lot. I knew a little bit about a lot of the issues. In Korea, it was all Korea, all day, 24 seven, every day, right? It was Korea, North Korea, China, and Japan. And it was, it was really focused on that. Uh, the role of, of, of the ambassador in, a, in any given country uh, is different than being a combatant commander because you're the president's personal representative, envoy. You know, the title is uh, 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 envoy extraordinary and plenty potentiary and all that kind of stuff. And it, you know, harkens back to the beginning of our nation. Uh, so the ambassador's, uh, uh, by, by position title, the ambassador carries a lot of weight. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, so I, I tried to balance all of that uh, and, uh, you know, try, try to get along every day. Um, at, 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 at PACOM, I had my own aircraft. In fact, I had two. I had a G5 and a 737 tricked out and comms wise and accommodation wise for me. Uh, you know, so everything was short, if you know what I mean. Uh, but uh, uh, at, uh, uh, in Korea, you know, when I flew back to the States, and I did quite often before COVID. Uh, you know, I flew back in 43D. You know, I was sitting back in economy class, uh, sandwiched between two larger people. And, uh, you know, I, I got used to that pretty quick, but that's just the, the scope of the difference. Uh, uh, the budget, uh, you know, the DOD's budget is, uh, is almost a trillion dollars. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the State Department's budget uh, is not. So, uh, you know, I had, I had to get used to that aspect of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there's a lot of different things. Uh, in in the in the military, uh, I was rarely attacked for who I was personally. Right? I mean, they might not like me because I'm an American. I'm carrying, you know, I'm an American uh, flagger officer, or maybe uh, maybe uh, I, before I was a flagger officer, you know, doing combat and all these things. You know, I did. They didn't like me because I was an American, but they didn't focus on the fact that you know I'm an Asian American or something like that. I got it from both barrels in Korea. I got it primarily from China. I, got, I actually got it from China at the end of my time in uniform when I was back fleet and then PACOM because I took some strong stances uh, against uh, uh, the PRC, which some of which I alluded to in my remarks tonight. And so they, they took me to task 
not just because I, I, you know, I criticized them and they didn't take me to task because I was an American, uh, you know, uh, uh, flag officer, Admiral criticizing China. They took me to task because I was Japanese American. And then in Korea, uh, anytime that I took a position that ran counter to what they wanted, what the Koreans wanted politically, you know, this is because I was President Trump's ambassador, right? So he took some, he had some very unpopular positions in Korea. They, they loved that he was uh, uh, proactive for leaning with Kim Jong-un and try to bring peace to the peninsula and uh, transform relations between the United States and North Korea. They loved that. But they didn't like that, that he, he wanted a, a, a larger share of, for, from them from, uh, for burden sharing, cost sharing, uh, and things like that. So, you know, when I had to deliver the hard message, you know, we talked about Huawei and 5G uh, and, uh, you know, how we wanted Korea not to, not to uh, uh, allow uh, Huawei uh, into their 5G infrastructure as they were getting ready to do that. Uh, they went after me for being Japanese American. Of course, I had a mustache then, uh, and that was a particularly uh, uh, a focal point for them. You know, it was the mustache that, I, I couldn't believe it, you know, that, 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 a, that a bit of facial hair would, would, would uh, you know, create that much uh, interest, shall we say. So, you know, that, that was a little bit difficult uh, and unexpected, uh, uh, but, you know, the reality is the reality and, you know, you, you work through that. Uh, you asked about President Park. I got there after uh, President Park had, had been impeached. So I, I got there in July of 2018, a month after uh, the Singapore summit, uh, th three or four months after the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Uh, so President Moon had already been in power. So when I presented my credentials, I presented them to President Moon. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. I, you know, I, I'm not sure what direction, how far you want me to take this, but I'll just wait for further on questions. No, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, Xiang, uh, feel free to ask your, ask your question. Hey, good evening, sir. Uh, Mr. Minter Fa uh, My question is, um, so a robust trilateral relationship between the U.S., Japan, and the ROK is, you know, clearly a key to combating the security issues that we face in Asia. Um, and, and as we all know, there are historical animosities between Japan and the ROK, which is rooted in what happened in World War II. So, you know, trust is still a major issue. So um, how do you think these two countries can get over this, I guess, hump and able to reconcile and strengthen their relationship moving forward? Yeah. You know, uh, we, we can be helpful, but we're not gonna do it for them. You know, we can't want it more than they want it. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see the one wanting it greatly because they have the, the domestic constituencies to worry about. Uh, President Moon can't be reelected because, you know, they have a single five-year term uh, for president in, in, in Korea, but he'd like his party to be reelected, you know? And so, uh, you know, that's, so, uh, relations with Japan plays into the body politic in Korea in a big way, especially in the run up to an election. Ditto in Japan, uh, former Prime Minister Abe stepped down, Prime Minister Suga is now in control, elections coming up, you know? And so, uh, you know, it's an issue. So I, I just don't see it, uh, happening anytime soon. I do hope, though, and there, there is hope uh, that the two can reach an accord uh, to the degree that uh, uh, that their relations with each other affecting their relations with us and other uh, uh, partners and allies. Or they don't have any other allies, but w with other partners and stuff won't be counterproductive. So we have it, it requires work. Uh, we have to continue to, to work at it, but we can't want it more than they want. And so, you know, we went through this, this really hard spot uh, in 2018 and, and beginning of 2019 uh, over the, the bilateral defense intelligence sharing agreement between Korea and Japan, where Korea threatened uh, to pull out of this agreement. So we got involved in it because uh, as you correctly noted, this, the roots of this conflict between Tokyo and Seoul are, are based on history and, the, and it's the history of the colonialism, the colonial uh, period where Japan colonized Korea from 1905 roughly 
1945. A pretty brutal, brutal colonization. And it was during that period that that uh, that these attitudes hardened. Uh, and so even after uh, World War II and the colonial period ended uh, and, uh, and all of that, the, the historical animosities remain. And then these historical animosities, uh, you know, uh, rose up to the level affecting uh, economic relations between the two countries. And even then we said, hey, you know, we're, we're not gonna take sides here. Uh, you, you all need to work this out. And then, you know, uh, Korea then threatened uh, to pull out of the Jasomia, the, the, the information sharing agreement with Japan. That then affects US security uh, and the security in Northeast Asia, of which we are allied with Tokyo uh, and Seoul, in, you know, in, independently, not, not, not trilaterally. Uh, and so the State Department at the time made a very strong statement where we said that if Korea were to pull out of the information sharing agreement with Tokyo, that would make our ability to defend the, the, uh, the Republic of Korea under uh, the treaty with Korea. And it would make, uh, it would put US forces, you know, we have 20,500 troops plus your families on the peninsula, it would put US forces at greater risk. That is a very strong statement for the United States to make, not taking sides, but saying, hey, don't be pulling out of this agreement because it affects our ability to defend you and it affects our ability to, to protect our people. So uh, that, that was a, a, a strong statement. Uh, you know, I, I had to deliver that statement uh, and uh, the outcome was, uh, uh, you know, that and other things contribute to it, no doubt. But the outcome was South Korea did not pull out the information sharing agreement. Yeah, that was a good thing. So, you know, that's kind of where we are. Uh, there's, there's talk about the Quad and whether South Korea will get into the Quad. The Quad is this informal uh, grouping of like-minded nations. It's the United States, Australia, Japan, and India. Uh, it's not an alliance. There's no treaty. There's no uh, uh, rule set. There's no codification of this thing. But should Korea be a member of the Quad? Uh, you know, and so th th that's an issue that's, uh, that's playing out uh, in, in real time today. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I believe Simon had his hand raised next. Uh, hi, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us. This has been super interesting so far. My question is about your involvement in the deployment of FAD in South Korea. And I know back in 2017 that you said that uh, you thought that it was useful as a deterrent to North Korea. Do you think that position, do you still take that position? Do you think that it's now mostly designed for deterrence against China because of the sort of yeah. green issues with it? or um, yeah, or like, so how, how do you say? It's a great question. So uh, I, I, I was deeply involved in the deployment of THAAD to uh, Korea uh, as, the, as the PACOM commander. And then as the, uh, when I got there as the ambassador, THAAD was already in place. There was a lot of uh, protest activity against it, resupply of the THAAD uh, battery, the, 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 the troops that are down there, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff uh, was a challenge, big challenge and was an issue. I said in, in 2017, as you correctly stated, and I still say today and I, that THAAD exists for only one reason, and that's to defend against North Korean uh, ballistic missiles, short range, intermediate range ballistic missiles. THAAD had no capability and has no capability against uh, Chinese missiles, uh, you know, and, and, it's, and it's, it's a single battery. I mean, it, it, it doesn't, but even if it did, you know, it, it, the Chinese could overwhelm it easily, just in, in numbers alone. And so uh, that was never designed against uh, the PRC uh, and has no capability really against the PRC. It is there to defend Southern the southern uh, South Korea against the North Korean missile threat. Not, not the Seoul area, not the Gizma, the greater Seoul metropolitan area, because there are other weapon systems in the Gizma to do that. 
we're talking southern, central and southern South Korea, where all the S pods, the the seaborne ports of debarkation, the APODs, the area ports of debarkation, where all the stuff that's going to flow in to Korea if we go to if uh, the war resumes with North Korea, all that stuff is going to come in, and so that is there to protect that and the people who live in uh, uh, in southern Korea. That is the only reason we have that there. It's there for a big reason, uh, and it has everything to do with North Korea, nothing to do with the PRC. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. Um, Nicholas, I think you had your hand up next. Hi, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask a uh, question about uh, our foreign policy towards North Korea. Um, I guess in regards to the options of either maintaining like a really hard line stance against North Korea or trying to pursue some kind of cooperation, which would you think would be more advantageous in the future? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a really important question. So let, let me just kind of parse it a little bit here. So first thing is to, is to understand uh, what what does KGU, Kim Jong-un want? And, you know, we have to, before that, understand that Kim Jong-un is in control of North Korea solely. You know, it, it's, not a, it's not a power sharing thing. It's not a, it's KGU himself. So what does he want? I think he wants four things. He wants sanctions relief. Uh, he wants to keep his nuclear weapons. Uh, he wants to split the US ROK alliance. Uh, and he wants to dominate the peninsula in, in a way that, that the whole peninsula looks like North Korea under his control. So those are the four things he wants. Uh, I, I think that sanctions is very important. I think the hard, Crushing sanctions is what brought Kim Jong-un to the negotiating table in the first place in 2018 uh, in Singapore. So I think it's important that, that we maintain sanctions. I, I think that those voices that are calling for sanctions relief or easing of exercises, military exercises with uh, uh, South Korea and the United States, you know, th that sort of thing as an enticement to bring North Korea back to the negotiating table is a completely uh, flawed approach. If we, we keep the sanctions on and encourage Kim Jong-un to come to the table again, and if as a result of negotiations, there are some lessening of sanctions, there's some reduction of or elimination of certain exercises and all of that as an outcome of negotiations, I'm all for it. But let's not give away stuff just to get him to negotiate. I mean, this is, this is Einstein's definition of insanity, right? You know, you, you repeat the same experiment and hope for a different outcome. We've been down this road before. It has not worked. It hasn't worked whether it's a Republican administration or Democratic administration uh, whether it's a progressive party, uh, conservative party in Korea, South Korea, I mean, it, it hasn't worked. So let's let's have the negotiations. Let's build on Singapore. You know, those four outcomes are pretty pretty darn good outcomes. Casey, you signed on to them, and let's build on that and go forward. Uh, I like uh, what I've read. I haven't seen it in writing, uh, but I like what I've read in the newspapers and the media. Uh, about uh, the policy review that the Biden administration just finished. I think they finished it last Friday. Jen Psaki, the spokes, spokesperson, talked about it. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a, of, a, of a position between the previous two administrations' positions. If you think, according to them, uh, that the, the Obama administration or the Trump administration's approach was all or nothing uh, and the Obama's administration's approach was strategic patience. Their approach is somewhere in between that. Diplomacy is important. Let's have a discussion. Let's encourage negotiations uh, and go from there. Thank you. Um, Lionel, you want to take it away? 
Hi, yeah, uh, thanks very much, Admiral Harris, for coming to speak with us. Um, I'm Lionel, I'm one of the uh, Tufts alum uh, Allies alumni. Um, I sort of had two questions for you uh, going off uh, your remarks. Uh, the first one speaks more uh, specifically to uh, the Quad and uh, the Five Eyes arrangement. So uh, Jacinda Ardern, um, New Zealand Prime Minister, is currently under, uh, coming under a lot of flack uh, for her pushback over expanding the ambit of uh, Five Eyes. Uh, to counteract China. So I wanted to hear what um, your view is on the use of entities like Five Eyes and the Quad uh, to counteract China. Um, and do you see this as reflective of some of the challenges perhaps peripheral countries might face in maintaining their relations with China? Uh, yeah. That's the first question. Um, and okay, well, let me ask that question and then we'll sure. get to the second. If I, do, if, I, if I let you continue on, I'll for, forget the first question and I'll, or, I, or I won't answer it at all because it's a harder question. So uh, Thank you. there is every reason to have these uh, formal and informal groupings. The Quad as it is today is an informal grouping. Five Eyes is a formal grouping. FPDI, the Five Powers Defense Arrangement, of which Singapore is a part, is a formal grouping. ANZUS is a formal treaty. Uh, you know, we... we uh, 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 decided, we, the United States, decided not to afford treaty protections under ANZUS to New Zealand, even though the NZ in ANZUS is New Zealand because of their stance on nuclear-powered warships. Uh, but our, but what's, what remains is, about, is, a, uh, is a treaty with Australia and defense treaty. So th there's every reason to have these uh, groupings. They're helpful. They're helpful in, in, uh, uh, in uh, 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 hard scenarios, you know, not post 9 11, Iraq, Afghanistan, all that. They're, they're helpful in uh, uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster response scenarios. You know, we're not part of FPDI, as you know, uh, but, but that, that organization does really, re really good work. Uh, there, there, are, there are other groupings in the region that are important. This is not getting into TPP and RCEP and uh, CPTPP and, and all that. You know, these are more. More defense oriented, I guess, uh, in, in, in certain their origins. They're not, uh, most of them are not, they're certainly not in their beginnings anti-China. You know, they existed before China uh, uh, became the power that it is. Uh, uh, some have come along because of China, in my, in my opinion, because countries recognize that uh, China left to its own devices and its own wishes uh, will set the conditions and set the real set, real, real set for the international rules-based order. We see that playing out uh, in uh, northern India along the frontier. We see it in Tibet. We see it, as I mentioned in my remarks, certainly in the South China Sea, East China Sea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, I mean, you name it, and, and China's actions and activities in the region are, are not helpful uh, for the good of the order. And it's not just in the region, right? We see China's activities in uh, South America and, and uh, even in, in Europe uh, and, uh, and, and, and on the continent of Africa. So we see these issues. Uh, but uh, I think uh, to get it, the, to, 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 to provide an answer to your specific question, yeah, there's every reason, good reason to have these uh, formal and informal groupings of like-minded countries. Uh, and I find them all helpful. Thanks. Um, so my quick second question is uh, regarding US foreign policy towards China under Biden. Um, you mentioned this previously and how you know the, funda the fundamental understanding towards China hasn't really changed. Um, and the mainstream understanding has also been that there have been more continuities um, under the Biden administration towards China um, than there have been differences um, since Trump's administration. Yeah. Um, can we expect um, any differences, uh, um, you know, in, in Biden administration's uh, approach towards China as we move yeah. forward as the ongoings you know, of administration's yeah. review continues? You know, I, I don't know why you think that, that I, I, I could answer that question, right? I mean, I'm not part of the Biden administration. They haven't reached out to me to ask my advice on things. So I, I don't know. All I know is uh, what I read in the papers, and when I, you know, and one of those things is, is, are, are some of those things are those statements that uh, Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin made. Uh, I know the players, 
you know, I was the military guy who traveled with Secretary of State Clinton and uh, Kerry uh, before I went to Hawaii in 2013. So, you know, uh, I know Kurt Campbell very well. He was my professor when I was at the Kennedy School. Uh, he was Assistant Secretary for East Asia Pacific EAP uh, in the Clinton uh, State Department. Uh, bright, bright guy. Jake Sullivan, a bright, bright guy. Uh, you know, he, he was the uh, 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 the uh, uh, George Kennan job, you know, SP uh, at the State Department uh, when uh, uh, Secretary Clinton was the secretary. So, I mean, these are really bright people that really understand the problem set. You've got Sung Kim, who's the acting Assistant Secretary of State for EAP, and he's going to be replaced by uh, Dan Crittenbrink, who's the uh, ambassador to Vietnam, who was in the in the Obama White House on the National Security Staff for Asia, assuming he gets confirmed. I don't want to want to uh, make uh, you know put it in jeopardy as confirmation, but he's been nominated for that job. And these are really bright people that understand Asia. They understand the the the, the uh, challenges. They they got a, they have the right sight picture on on uh, China, uh, and I think that uh, you know their approach is going to be different. But right? I, I think they're going to uh, based on based on my understanding and reading, and just just as you could understand and read. Uh, you know, they, they, the Biden administration and President Biden himself places great uh, reliance on alliances, far more than, than uh, President Trump and his team did. So uh, President Biden, you know, alliances matter. Alliances are essential. You know, they're not luxuries, they're essentials. Uh, and so that's going to be helpful. You know, in, in, in crafting this policy review on North Korea, they reached out to Japan. Uh, Prime Minister Suga. I know they reached out to uh, interlocutors in Korea, even though President Moon and President Trump hadn't, I mean, President Biden hadn't actually met, you know, that, that meeting is going to happen at the end of this month, toward the end of this month. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, so they're, they're, they're going to listen to, the Biden team is going to listen to America's allies, friends, and partners uh, to get their view. So I, I think that's encouraging. I think it's the right thing to do, uh, and I think it's helpful. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, I believe Harrison, you're next. I get you, sir. Uh, mission in second class, Charlton. Um, so, with the increased buildup in forces in the region, from the British sending aircraft carrier to the Philippines uh, sending warships into the South China East China Seas. Vietnam sending more warships um, and Japan increasing um, their naval capabilities from building new helicopter destroyers to a full fledged literally the first aircraft carrier since the Second World War. Um, do you believe South Korea will have a more martial role in the future or do you versus the PRC or do you think they're going to be focused more upon the uh, North Korean threat as forces like from around the world start to build yeah. up the area? I, I, I don't see uh, South Korea using the PRC as a raison d'etre for having a strong military. I, I think they'll have a strong military because that's the right and the expectation of every um, modern um, uh, industrial technologically savvy country, of which South Korea clearly is one. You know, it's in their best interest to have the ability to defend themselves against all threats, whether that threat is from the north uh, or from the uh, uh, the west, the cardinal direction west, not not the west. Right. So um, I, I think that uh, that, uh, that that they are going to increase their military capability uh, for sure, and they're doing that now. You know, uh, uh, they have JSF, Joint Strike Fighter, F-35s, they have Global Hawk, uh, P-8s, uh, you know, Aegis, uh, Aegis uh, destroyers, uh, modern uh, diesel submarines. And there are, there are voices in South Korea that are arguing for nuclear submarines, uh, in South Korea rather, arguing for nuclear submarines and uh, uh, greater capability and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, they haven't done that yet, but they have modern diesel submarines. Uh, as does Japan. We see Japan 
building up its capability uh, because it faces uh, some very real threats. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm encouraging all of this. Uh, I, I think it's good for every country to, to have its own enlightened self-interests at heart first uh, and foremost. Thank you for that answer. It was very wonderful. Um, Heather? Hi, uh, my uh, question is uh, going to be on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. I mean, Biden's administration is going to be like, I believe, the fifth administration in a row that's going to make this a top priority. But how likely do you think that's actually to happen? Like, what's the situation that you can see where Kim Jong un would actually agree to that and actually follow through on that? I mean, every yeah. uh, analysis I've seen has been like, this is a like uh, keeping the nuclear weapons is an essential Korean goal and there's nothing that you can actually do to get them to give it up. Yeah, so I, I agree with, with, with your basic premise. I mean, it's gonna be really, really hard. As I said, I think Kim Jong-un, as I mentioned earlier in response to somebody else's question, uh, that uh, one of his top four priorities is to keep his nuclear weapons and split the alliance, uh, you know, uh, uh, rule the peninsula. Uh, and uh, get sanctions relief, right? So, I mean, that's, I mean, I believe that that's what he believes. I believe that's what he wants. So it's gonna be really hard uh, to convince him to give up nuclear weapons, that to, 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 to have a, an independent free South Korea on his border that doesn't threaten him, right? I mean, he, he's threatening South Korea, but South Korea is not threatening him. Uh, so it's hard, uh, but I, the, it, as hard as it is, uh, I think it's okay to be caught trying. Right, I mean, right. We ought to, we ought to try if we can, uh, and we ought not to give up. But that's why you have diplomats. That's why you have a you know a lot of, a lot of people that are putting a lot of brain power to it. Uh, COVID uh, might uh, encourage uh, North Korea to to come back to the negotiating table. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I I don't know why I say that. You know, they haven't had any COVID cases according to according to Kim Jong Un, but uh, you know, I, I think COVID and the sanctions and the, uh, the the decrease in productivity, the decrease in, in illegal trading and, and legal trading for that matter, all that combines to, to create a situation whereby um, negotiations uh, and uh, leading to sanctions relief uh, is uh, a real possibility. The other possibility is a darker one, right? And so don't know what direction Kim Jong-un is gonna take. We have to be ready for the darker possibility uh, but we ought to encourage and support uh, the uh, more positive one. Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Uh, so do you think, you know, like, in that view, like, the U.S. is just going to keep trying, but we're just going to be in the situation where we're nominally still trying, but we just come to the acceptance that North Korea will never give up its nukes? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, that's looking in the future and, and uh if I said yes to that, it'd be a defeatist kind of a look, right? Uh, so I, I think we should continue to try until, until uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know, until Kim Jong-un takes that darker path or we come to the realization that, that, uh, uh, that is, nothing is gonna work. And if we come to that realization, Kim Jong-un might be driven to that darker path, right? So you might have a, an inverse cause and effect thing going here. So I think we continue to try uh, and we continue, and South Korea for sure is trying. I mean, President Moon and his team are out there, you know, trying to figure out how to bring Kim Jong Un back to the table, and how to provide some relief uh, for the North Korean people that don't run afoul of U United Nations sanctions. Uh, and so, you know, they're they're trying really hard. China would would which would like the tensions on the peninsula to be reduced and sanctions to be relieved. Well, I mean. You know, we, we've said what it's going to take for sanctions to be relieved, to be reduced, eliminated even. So, you know, it's uh, right now it's it's up to Kim Jong-un. Uh, you know, um, it always is at the end of the day, I suppose, but but more so than ever, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the arms are, open arms are extended. You know, at, at the height of the, of the short range provocations, during the during the Trump administration, after Hanoi, even after the snap summit at Pyong at, at uh, uh, Pemichon, even even with all of that, 
President Trump extended the open hand and not the closed fist to Kim Jong-un. So, and, and so the door is open. He has to walk through it though. You know, we can't reach out there and grab him and drag him through it. So, so he's gonna have to walk through it. Okay. Um, thank you so much for answering yep. that. Um, I will ask a final question unless anyone has any objections. I think, I think we're good. I think it's time for one last question. <laughs> Um, my question is more of a broader, more, not necessarily predictive, but just more general question. Um, how would you describe, do you think, the trajectory of U.S.-Korean relations, and also especially Korean and Japanese relations? And how do you think that this relation will evolve in the future? Not necessarily how it could get better, but how it when will. When you say Korean, you mean South Korea or North Korea? Yeah, sorry, I mean South Korean, yes. Uh, you know, as I as I related, uh, said in my remarks, you know, any any co-equal relationship over seven decades is going to have its ups and downs. And Korea today is completely different than Korea in 1953 and throughout the 60s and 70s and most of the 80s. Right? I mean, Korea has been a democracy only since the late 80s which is kind of hard to believe, right? I mean, you know, I, I look at the picture behind you, I look at Korea, I think, wow, Korea's always been a democracy, it has not been. It was only until the late eighties uh, that it became a democracy. So it's a young democracy. So our relationship with Korea in, in that sense uh, has had its ups and downs. On the, on the alliance sense, the military alliance, security alliance, you know, at the heart of the military relationship between the, the ROC armed forces and the U.S. armed forces, manifested primarily by U.S. forces Korea, has been extremely close and extremely strong. And now we're at the point, you know, at one time, the U.S. four-star had command of, had an operational control of, of everything that the ROC armed forces did, you know, peacetime and wartime. And now it's only wartime. And, and that's being looked at to, to, to have a path toward uh, returning operation control of the Korean military in wartime to the Koreans. And that the combined forces commander, the commander who's responsible for US and Korean forces would shift to a Korean general at some point in time. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's how far the military relationship has grown over time and in, in, in all in a positive way. Uh, now, the second part of the question, are you, is it US Japan or ROK Japan? ROK Japan. Yeah, so it's on a bad trajectory right now. The military relationship is good. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, Japanese forces and, and uh, military forces and Korean military forces interact globally. Uh, you know, they're in the, in, in the uh, the Gulf of Aden, uh, counter piracy, North Arabian Sea, uh, uh, maritime security operations there together, not 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 working in a, in one for the other, but they're working in the same water space, you know, same regional area together, and they and they work together really well. Uh, so they share a lot of common systems, right? Aegis, uh, 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 J Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, all, all a lot of common systems. So the military to military relationship is good, but the military to military relationship is hampered, of course, in a democracy or, or is affected in a democracy by the national relationships. And the national relationship, in my view today, uh, is on a downward trajectory. So, it, and we're encouraging both countries to stop, stop the downward trend and, and you know, come back up uh, together because of the uh, they shared interests, shared threats, shared concerns, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but but I, I'm I'm not uh, uh, pleased with the direction that I see uh, Japan Korea relations uh, today. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you uh, for joining us this evening on Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, um, be a Cinco de Mayo day, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for coming what you're doing. Thanks for all that you're doing. Thank you. All right. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.